Okay, so prayer. You know, it's from Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. Jesus said, and when you pray, da, 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 and he went on. So it wasn't if you pray or if you think about praying. It's, he just said, and when you pray. So prayer is like an expected part of our Christian walk. And um, whether we're praying through desire or through devotion or for desperation, prayer is our communication with God. It is connecting with him and talking to him. You know, in James chapter 5, verse 16, it says that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That's the old King James version. I was originally King James. And um, because back in those days, there wasn't too many choices back, you know, 40, 50 years ago. And um, so the effectual fervent prayer, so many parts of that, the effective, how do we make our prayers effective? Fervent, how do we make our pray prayers fervent? Because the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And we want, when we pray, we want, we want things to happen. Um, otherwise it just becomes some babbling words that we go on with speaking them into the air and so why do we do it uh, prayer is is more than just a tradition or a habit prayer is our communication with our heavenly father um, and it all has a purpose and so in it all we just need to keep it simple um, it's not like um, like when you go to buy a new car and the salesman says to you, come out, I'll show you this new Chevy here. Now, the uh, engine capacity of this is uh, 5.7 litres. It has a 20 to 1 compression ratio. And with the new blower on the top of it, it blows in at between 6 and 8 pounds per square inch, which will increase your horsepower from a mere 400 horsepower to that of about 700 horsepower, equal to a combi. And people go, wow. <laughs> He doesn't. And though, so we could do that for prayer. I could go through the Bible and do a whole exegesis on prayer and, and look at all the Greek and the Hebrew and um, all the other meanings of the words. To, but what is it? It's just information. When you go to the, to, to the car sales and you see the new Chev, he takes you out to it and he says, you want to get from A to B? Here's a steering wheel. That's the accelerator. That there's a brake. Use it if you need it. And these are the blinkers, optional. And we go, great. <laughs> well, that's how most people drive. And um, so, but prayer is a bit like that. And so sometimes prayer just comes straight out of desperation. But it's mostly out of relationship to God. Um, my beautiful wife and I have been married for 37 years this year. And um, how could he? I was very young. And she was younger. And, uh, but in that time, communication, you know, you learn from the start. At, when you first get married, you, you sort of think that your, your wife is a mind reader. How come she didn't know that? <laughs> Why did she do that? What the hell's going on there? And what is that thing? You know, and we expect that she would know everything about us. And, but we've got to communicate. We've got to build a relationship. Um, I had to get to know her. Uh, at the start, when we first met, I, it was like, ooh, hey, that's nice. And um, <laughs> so we got engaged. And we, got, we got engaged very quickly, actually. Um, from the first time I asked Jill out until I proposed to her, 12 days. And um, while her head was still spinning, and um, then we were married six months later. And, um, but then I started to learn about this person that I married. And, um, and to her horror, she started to learn about the bloke that she'd married. She, I didn't sign up for that, you know. I was looking for a husband, not a pet. And, um, but here we are, very well trained pet and taller trained everything. And, um, but our prayer is like that. It's our communication with God that we get to learn a lot about God. But the main thing is the talking. Uh, that's how I learned so much about my wife is because I loved and devoted and I stayed close, but I spoke and I listened. And, and so it is. There's no abracadabra about it. There's no... You know, there's no great study we can do that will make it so that God hears our prayers. And we don't have to be good enough for God to hear our prayer. Prayer is communication and it's just talking with the Lord. But, you know, there's a few things that we need to avoid. And like right at the start, I've got to say, you've got to keep it real. You know, um, 
my advice would be no peacock prayers. Um, if you can understand what that means. You know what peacocking is? <laughs> look at me, look at me, you know. And um, sometimes when, when people pray, you know, Jesus warned about it in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. It says, and, and when you pray, um, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the street, that they might be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. That is their reward, the accolation of men, the esteem of men, people thinking, wow, aren't they wonderful? Because they can say the big words and they can, they can quote the Bible. But, you know, prayer and humility go together. You know, it, it, one of the things that used to really always annoy me is um, being a Christian for a long time and being in churches, you go to prayer meetings and that, and, and sometimes they try to G everyone up so that they'll be praying and so they'll be worshipping and, you know, asking people to pray or to lead a prayer. And the amount of times I've heard a leader say, if you can't pray in public, you mustn't pray in private, you know. And I go, what? You know, meaning that if you're not game enough to pray in public, then obviously you're not praying in, playing in, praying in private. It's almost like if you can't play the guitar here, you're not practising at home. It's two different things. And um, so our prayer, um, predominantly at the start, is meant to be private. It's meant to be that communication with God. So if anyone's ever said that to you in church, I apologise for them and I ask you to forgive them and let it go. Um, if, you, if you are a private prayer, if you're someone that, that stays out of the spotlight a bit but you've got a heart, you love God and you love to talk with him, your prayer is effective. You know, and the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman availeth much. So um, the thing is, is that these people that are peacocking and carrying on, that they do get results. And that sometimes adds to the confusion. But we see in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus, it's, Jesus is talking about the end of the times when he's sorting out the sheep from the goats, basically. And he says, you know, you are the sheep, you come to my right, you enter into eternal life. You blokes are the gates, uh, you go to the left and go into eternal damnation. In biblical times, sheep and goats, as I've explained once before here, sheep and goats look the same back in the Middle East. Sheep and goats look the same. They were both sort of a bit hairy and a bit woolly, and, um, except they had a couple of differences between them. Uh, the sheep were grazers and they'd follow the shepherd. Goats are browsers. They're always looking for something better and they're always off here after that and off there after that. And the other thing too is, is the sheep, their tails hang down and the goats, their tails hang up. Um, it's an interesting fact. The tails hang up and they're always exposing themselves. Like sheep, they keep it secret. It's between them and God. But it says here that many will say, you got that one, many will say, Matthew chapter 7, 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons and in your name done many wonders? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Wow. So they were having results. They cast out demons in Jesus' name. They did many mighty wonders in Jesus' name, but that wasn't good enough. Because that, Jesus, you know, the Lord is not so much after results as he is after relationship, after your heart. So if in the past you've put yourself down or you've been put down because of the, the apparent results of your prayers, look, just set that aside today, okay? That doesn't matter because sometimes those false ideas that come into our head and sometimes the enemy puts them there to discourage us, to stop us from praying or to stop us getting that deep relationship with God. Because if we feel that, you know, we've been praying and we haven't been seeing the results, I'm not a good prayer, I mustn't have a good relationship with God, why should I keep trying? I'm just not as good as everyone else because I see these people, they're praying and they're getting the results. What about me, God? Nothing seems to be happening with me. And again, we bring it back to it's about relationship. You know, it's about those secret things that are happening. And again, likening it back to marriage, I've seen plenty of marriages where people have been in public, they look honky-dory, everything's good, flash cars, jewellery, you know, holding hands and that. But at home, there's abuse. 
You know, there's no love. There's control and manipulation. You know, there's children being broken. There's hearts and lives being broken. But in the public eye, it looks good. We don't want any of that in our prayer. We want a close, personal relationship with God because it works. And that's what he wants with us. He wants us to come to him because we love him and we need him, not for any other uh, personal reason. So regular prayer. Regular prayer, I want to just share a little bit about daily prayer, personal prayer, and private prayer. This is where it all begins. And um, Matthew chapter 6, verses 6 to 8, it says, But when, but you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who sees in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Don't be like them, for your Father who knows the things that you need uh, before you ask him. And again, this is coming back to that closeness with God, that communion with God, uh, going into your room, shutting your door, or go to that private place where you feel that you can be yourself. Um, years ago, when I first, uh, later on we're going to talk about baptism in the Holy Spirit just briefly, but years ago when I was first a Christian, I was 18, and for the first time in my life I saw people praying in tongues. You know, and all that, you know. And I first saw it and I thought, this is amazing. And I'd heard about the power of praying in the Spirit and, and um, direct communication with God. And I thought, man, I want that. Just that prayer language, praying to God. And, and I thought that when, when I got baptised in the Holy Spirit, that I'd go out for prayer. And I thought when I got baptised in the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit would move through me and my jaw would start moving and my tongue and all these perfect prayers would come out and these languages would come out and I'd be connected with God. So I had this real, almost like a, a fairy tale um, imagination of what praying in tongues was. So I came out for prayer and I got prayed for and I waited for it to happen and it didn't happen. And I waited and it didn't happen. And so I tried to copy the bloke who was praying for me and so I copied him a little bit, and he was going, Haba shama rama bamba de bam. And so, Haba shama rama bamba bamba bamba. And um, didn't feel any different. And I walked back to my seat, and I thought, I didn't get it. I'm not good enough for God. I don't know. The next Sunday, I went out again. Same thing. And on the third Sunday that I went out, there was a visiting speaker, and he said to me, He said, The devil will try to stop you communicating privately with God like this. So he will tell you that, um, that you're making it up and you're not doing it um, and you're not connecting with God so that he will stop you from praying. He said, but I'll tell you the best way to do. When you get home, find a private place. Even if they have to go in the dunny, lock the door, sit in there and you pray in that language. And I could pray in a language. I, I used to muck around at school pretending I could speak French or German or Chinese, you know, and... I could speak Chinese, I just can't understand it. But, and and um, so I got into the toilet, locked the door, and I started, and I thought, gee, that sounds pretty good. That's sort of like an islander, you know, a bit of Italian in there, a bit of French. And, um, but I kept praying like that, and no one could see me. I was in my private place. And you know what? It tells us in, in, um, in, in uh, I think it's uh, in 3 John, it says, praying in the Spirit, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Spirit. And so as I continued to pray in tongues in the toilet, no one else could hear me. I could feel my spirit being built up. And I thought, this is it. This is it. And um, I've practiced that now. Um, for the last 43 years. And it's been the strength of my life, just being able to come into that secret place. Sometimes we pray in the spirit, sometimes we pray with understanding, we know the words that we say. But it's been, it's been something that worked for me, that personal prayer, and it's been the strength of my life. So you don't have to know all these, you know, great and wonderful big words to be able to pray to God. He doesn't want to hear that. 
Really, he wants to hear your heart. He wants to hear what's going on in your life. He wants to hear how you're feeling, whether things are going great, you know, and sometimes we think we have to go to God and pray in faith, you know, and declare everything in faith, you know. Sometimes we just go to God and we go, God, it's all falling apart. And, um, but he hears us. And th- the Bible says that for your father knows the things that you have need of before you ask. Not everything goes to plan. But we need to understand that he loves us, he sees us, and he hears us. Um, and there's going to be times in our life when we hit that desperation button where we really need prayer and we need prayer to work. <coughs> um, when I was about, Jill and I have been married for two years. And um, my mum and dad hadn't long moved down to Toowoomba and uh, we were living in Toowoomba. And uh, mum and dad had just been around visiting us at our place and, and uh, it was really good. We just told them that we were pregnant for the first time. She was pregnant, I had the belly. And um, it was a proud moment. Um, and they went, they were on their way to a prayer meeting. And uh, about a, half an hour later, my brother came flying back in mum and dad's car and said, quick, you've got to come to the hospital. Dad's had a heart attack. Stuff like that, you don't get a warning of. You don't get time to build up to it, to think about it. You don't get time to build, to, you know, to start studying it in a word and praying and finding some prayers to say or whatever. But it, it hits you like that, and that is a moment of desperation. And we jumped in the car and we headed up to the hospital. And straight away, as I was driving, I started praying in the spirit. I didn't know how to pray. I didn't know what to do. What you know? I, I've never come across heart attack prayers before, and. Um, when we got there, um, he was in a very serious way in, uh, uh, in emergency. And um, so, again, I didn't know what to pray, but I knew that my father cared. And so I just kept praying. And um, the uh, doctor came out after about, must have been half an hour, an hour, and they said, there's nothing else we can do for him. Um, they said, we put three lots of cardio packs through him, and he's still not breathing on his own, hasn't got a regular heartbeat, like that's it. And um, I said to the doctor, can, can Antoine and I, he was our pastor, go in and pray for him? And she said, yeah, right, eh? come on in. Probably thought we were going in to administer the last rites or something. And we got in there and it was just an awful sight. His belly was all swollen up and he had tubes and pipes and coming out of him and everything. I was desperate. So it wasn't a, um, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray my God, my soul to keep. It wasn't that sort of a prayer. Um, it was uh, f- fairly high volume and just calling out to God, don't let him die. I knew that I could use the name of Jesus and I knew the authority that were, there was in his name. But the Holy Spirit helped us. And I called out in the name of Jesus, I rebuked death, and I commanded him to come back to life. And um, we turned and we walked out, left him there. Um, About five minutes later, the doctor comes out and he goes, well, I don't know what happened, but he's got a regular heartbeat and he's breathing on his own. And um, so we thought, good, there's more to the story, I'll tell you that later. But it was about the desperation of prayer. Have you been in that place? Have you been in that place where your child has fallen down and broken an arm? What do you do? Uh, Have you been in that place where someone comes in and says, I just lost my job, I don't know what to do, I feel like stepping in front of a bus? You know, desperation stuff comes, but the thing is, is that God is always there. A man named Jairus come to Jesus, and uh, he said to Jesus, um, my daughter, she's dying. Can you come and pray for her? He had the only hope he had was the hope in Jesus, and he'd only just heard about Jesus for a little bit. Because he was a ruler of the synagogue, there was all these other different ideas that were probably going on in his head because the Jews in the synagogue, they didn't like Jesus, and they didn't, a lot of them didn't believe in him, and there was arguments either way. But when you're desperate, you'll grab the thing that gives you hope. 
And so Jairus went to Jesus and said, will you come and pray for my daughter? And it's the same with us. We can go to God in that desperation and there's nothing else that qualifies us. We don't have to have been to Bible college. We don't even have to have been a Christian, you know that? You don't have to have been a Christian for 10 years before God will hear your prayer. He tells us that he will always hear our prayer because before we loved him, he loved us. He loved us first. And when we came to Jesus and we repented, we were still sinners, but he heard our prayer. And the Lord will hear your prayer. If you want your prayers answered, just talk to God. That's praying. Another thing, one of the things that blocks us sometimes from our prayer is when things aren't right in our life. And I'll tell you, you know it. Um, there's a story about the account about David. You know King David? Great king, mighty king. And the Bible tells us that in, in the springtime when kings went to war, David decided he'd stay home this time because he'd been fighting a lot. So he'd pull back from his regular things that he did as a king leading the army and all that. Sometimes when we pull back and we get a bit, a bit slack and a bit lazy, it provides an opportunity for sin to come in because we're not as sharp as we should be. And so he'd pull back. David had pulled back and uh, one day he was up on the roof of his uh, castle and he was looking down and just over a little bit he saw the house of Uriah, one of the head men in his army. And Uriah had a beautiful one, young wife named Bathsheba. And Bathsheba was taking a bath and David was looking and he was going, oh, I don't mind that. And um, so he got one of his servants and he said, hey, can you go and uh, get her to come up and see me? So he did and she did and then they did. And um, she got pregnant. And besides David committing adultery, it was now that he was going to be found out that he committed adultery. And so what he did is he said to the leader of his army, uh, go and get Uriah, tell him to come home and spend a night, you know, a night or two with his wife, you know, because he's been working so hard out on the field. So they brought Uriah back from the battle to spend a couple of nights at home. But Uriah was a righteous man and he said, how can I? He come home and he said, what am I doing here? How could I be here when the armies of Israel are out fighting the enemy? I should be there. That's the place where I should be. And he refused to go into his wife's house. He just slept out on the balcony and the next morning went back home. So David was, would, was in danger of his sin being found out that he'd committed adultery with Bathsheba. So then he called the commander of his uh, regiment again and said, hey, when the battle's being really fierce, put uh, Uriah up against the wall and then pull back. So they did and so Uriah was killed. And um, so David then took Bathsheba as his wife and she was pregnant. And um, all this time, the conviction on David, he knew he hadn't done right. And Nathan the prophet came to David and said, hey, what should be done with the man? You know, that up here there was a farmer and he had a really nice little lamb. And then there was a rich man next door. He had plenty of sheep, but he liked that lamb. So he went and took that one lamb off the farmer and he, and he killed the lamb and ate it. And David said, that man is a really bad bloke. He should pay. He should, we should give him a good smacking around. And Nathan said to David, you're that bad bloke, mate. You took that man's wife and you had him killed. And the conviction of the Lord came upon David and um, he, the conviction was so strong that he couldn't sleep and he was sweating and shaking on his bed at night until he got to the point where he repented. And, you know, God didn't say to him, okay, that's it, mate, strike one year out. You're no longer going to be the king. God didn't say to him, no longer you're going to be in the bloodline for the saviour of the world, Jesus. We'll find someone else. He didn't. He repented and he was restored. And that's why we get in Psalm 51. It gives you the whole, uh, basically, list of the, of the stuff that David went through and his emotions or anything. But I especially like verses 10 to 12. And we sing it in an old song. And David was praying, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me and restore to me the joy of my salvation and uphold me with your generous spirit. And the Lord honoured him and the Lord forgave him and David was restored. 
you know, and the same with us, you know, when we, we're going to make mistakes. Man, I've made more mistakes than hair on a dog, I think, but I'm able to come to God and, and you, you ask for God for repentance, you, you, for forgiveness, but you repent. And when you repent, you acknowledge what you've done wrong because that's the thing, that's the sin in our life, the rebellion where we refuse to repent of our sin and when we hold that thing, our sin, dear to us, that it's more important than our relationship with God, that's when our prayers, they, it's like hitting the brass ceiling and they fall back down. We, 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 we wonder, why isn't God answering my prayers? And God's saying, well, you're not coming to me with a clean and a pure heart. You know, it's the same as if you've got a relationship with your husband or wife and, and you're out playing up and playing around with, you know, in town and you come home and you expect her to, or him to love you faithfully and they go, this marriage is in distress, mate. There's some things you've got to fix up first. And so it is with our relationship with God. When our relationship with God is in distress, it doesn't come from what we've done. Uh, he's done, it's come from what we've done. So it's us that have to come to him and repent and say, Lord, I'm sorry. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our, if we confess our sins, <coughs> he will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Cleans us, washes us clean again. And then our relationship is our, and our prayer time is completely, our communion is restored to God. We don't have the prophet Nathan to come and keep knocking on our door and saying, you've done it again, Joe. Now, here's today's list. But we have the Holy Spirit. And um, Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. And so the Holy Spirit comes and he convicts us. He doesn't go telling everyone else. He doesn't write it on the wall in blood. He doesn't put it on social media, you know. He doesn't, and he doesn't, you know, get us to tell everyone else's sins. But the Holy Spirit comes and he speaks to our heart and he convicts us. And we feel the weight of that conviction and we feel like, yeah, that thing I did or that lifestyle I've got or whatever's going on, it's not right. And I feel the weight of it. And that's the weight of the conviction. And so that's when we come to God and we repent. And the repentance means that we change direction. And instead of walking towards that sin, we walk away from it. And we make whatever decision we need to make and we decide to follow God again and, and listen to him, excuse me, and, and do what he asks us to do. And that's why David said, create in me a clean heart, O God. Because God comes and he washes that away from us. And again, our relationship is clean as if we've never sinned and renews our relationship and it also opens up Prayer opens up our prayer. So in prayer, when we do pray, we are going to understand that we pray in faith, we pray with understanding, and we pray with authority. So we're fully equipped for this whole prayer thing we have with God. We pray in faith knowing that because not only through his word but through experience and through other people's testimony, we know that when we pray, God always hears us. Okay? And... Um, but the first thing we need to do is understand that God is real and he wants to hear from us. And Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please God. For anyone who comes to him must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So when we pray, we've got to understand that God is there listening to us and he's waiting to hear from us. He's in it. We're in his presence. It's not like we're praying and no one's hearing. Sometimes it feels like that, but that's our emotions. Um, it's, not, it's not how it is with God. The Bible tells us his ear is always inclined towards us. <coughs> and so in praying with faith, knowing that God hears us, we also know that because he loves us, he loves to answer our prayers. Uh, another time I remember Jesus said to the disciples, he says, Look at the lilies of the field, how finely clothed they are. You know, how beautiful they are. And Solomon in all his wealth couldn't even dress himself as well as those beautiful lilies in the field. And he says, but you're more important to me than those lilies in the field. And look at the sparrows. You know, a lot of people look at sparrows as vermin, you know, lice-carrying, insect-eating vermin. And, uh, but he says, look at the sparrows of the field. He said, they never go without a meal. They always are fed. My Father in heaven always looks after them. He always feeds them. He always cares for them. You are more important than even the sparrows in the field. So to us, God, we are important to him. And he's, 
uh, we can understand that he wants to bless us. He wants to answer our prayer. And that's an encouragement to then pray, not thinking that we're coming like a beggar, begging God, because he wants the best for us. He wants to forgive us. He loves us and he's made provision for us. And so also we, um, we pray with authority, knowing that we're not, just, um, we're not just sending empty words out because Jesus said to us, when you pray, when you ask something from the Father, ask in my name. You now belong to me, so ask in my name. And so when we pray, we pray in Jesus' name, which actually means like we pray with the authority and the okay of Jesus. Like Jesus has sent us and he said, feel free to ask the Father. And so we go and we go, Father, in Jesus' name I'm asking this with the authority that he's given me. I, and he hears us. And Matthew 28, 18 says that Jesus said, all authority has been given to me, now I give it to you. Go, therefore, go in that authority. And again in Mark 16, 17, he said, and these signs will follow those, <coughs> will follow those who believe. In my name they'll cast out demons, they'll speak in new tongues, they'll take up servants, and, and if they drink any deadly poison, it won't hurt them. And they lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So we've got the love of the Father, the support of the Father, we've got the power of the Holy Spirit working in us, and we've got the permission of Jesus to go and do, to pray and to ask and to do. <clears throat> One little warning here is James chapter 4, verse 3. It's not on the slide, but James 4, 3 says, um, you ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss. It doesn't mean you're asking for a miss, like for a wife or anything. It's a miss. It, a, one word. You're asking you don't receive because you ask a miss, uh, that you could spend it on your own pleasures. So sometimes we think, you know, if God answers all prayer, he'll answer all prayer. But we pray according to God's will. Uh, and that's God's good intentions for us, uh, God's will, uh, the way that the culture of heaven works. So if you're having a bad time with your neighbour because he keeps playing loud music and driving up and down the road and skidding his tyres and that, you can't say, God, kill him in Jesus' name. You can't pray like that. You know, you can't see someone that they've got something that you really like and you say, Lord, I pray that they would forget that at work today and when they're gone, I'll come and take it home. That's, that's, not, that's not prayer. But we can... We can laugh at stuff like that, but sometimes if you think of some of the ways that we have prayed in the past, we have been asking amiss. We've been asking so that God would, that we could spend that on our own pleasures. Oh, Lord, we just, we pray for that new job. We pray for that big payment. Lord, we pray for that new car. We pray for that big house. Pray for that jet ski. You know, and we'd be praying for all this, and sometimes we're spending the money on all this, and we've got three or four cars in the driveway, we've got a flash house, we've got our jet ski, you know, we've got our motorbike, we've got our stereo system. But our wife is getting around in clothes from Vinnie. Our kids are, 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 are scabbing money at school to try to buy a tuck shop because they're not fed at home. Um, our neighbours are in disarray and we never lend them anything or give them a hand. See, that's so much out of balance. But if you're praying... You know, so that you could not only meet your own needs and meet your family's needs, but also so that you could be uh, part of that ministry of giving and loving people. Man, you'll find that God just answers so many prayers and you can never give away too much. God just keeps blessing you. And um, so when it comes to our prayers, pray in that way. Um, <clears throat> nearly finished. Got to remember the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts one eight says that, we will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon us and we will be his witnesses. And um, the thing about being God's witnesses is what are we witness to? We're witness to, to the whole God's kingdom. We're witnessing to who Jesus is. We're witnessing to the love, the generosity, the mercy, the grace and the forgiveness of God. We're not just sometimes we think that, um, and there's been some you know, over the last 20 or 30 years, there's been some doctrine that have got a little bit out of whack, and uh, I, I feel personally. And some of those things have been a bit like the uh, prosperity doctrine, you know, where we, we take on the power of the Holy Spirit in our prayer and we're declaring victory in this scenario and we want to be rich. And we, But 
that's not what it's about. That's a little bit about, I think, about misusing the power that God's given us. We've got power to intercede on other people's behalf and we've got power for God to resource us as well so that we can be a blessing. And that's what God said to Abraham, I will bless you so that you can be a blessing. And so when we, we have our attitude right, when we, have, when we use the power of God right, um, then we will see our lives be blessed. Go through hardships? Of course we will. That, a lot of those hardships we go through, they refine us. They teach us how to endure. They teach us how to um, hold on to promises of God. They teach us how to win graciously and, and, and lose humbly, you know. Um, sometimes bad things happen to good people, but that doesn't mean that um, the God is punishing us. It's just a broken world that we live in. And um, we need to understand that even when we're going through the worst of times, the deepest and darkest valleys, the grace of God still, still sustains us and we can still have his joy and his presence with us. So when we receive the power from the Holy Spirit, um, there's a lot more that comes with it than just speaking in tongues or laying hands on the sick so they recover. You know, there comes the revelation that comes with it. There also comes that um, being able to have the Holy Spirit intercede through us when we pray to God. Um, it tells us in that verse in Romans 26 and 27 that sometimes we come to situations and we don't even know what to pray. God, I know I should pray something. I don't know what to do in this case, as I spoke about when Dad had a heart attack. And a lot of you guys have been in positions like that and you think, well, what do I do? How do I pray? And we try to do stuff in our own strength. A lot of times we have to do stuff in our own strength as well. But we need to be guided and led by God. So even when we're praying to God, we don't even know what to pray for. That's when we pray in the Holy Spirit. And we're praying in tongues, but the Holy Spirit, who knows the mind of the Father, the Holy Spirit who knows the will of God, prays through our spirit and we're able to pray the will of God. You know, powerful things happen then. That's a whole subject on its own. But the other great thing about receiving power when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, we have him dwelling in us and, as I said before, he convicts the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. So when the, when the Holy Spirit leads us, when things are going wrong, he convicts us that things are going wrong, gives us conviction, we feel the weight of it. When things are going right, he also convicts us. Conviction is not always bad. Conviction is a confirmation. So he confirms to us that we're on the right track and things are going right, which helps us stand in faith even more. When, we've got, when we're stepping out on the water, you know, when we're stepping out in things of faith where we've never been and it's scary and that, with the Holy Spirit with us, he assures our heart and our spirit that we're going the right way, that we're in the word of God, that, that we're in the will of God, and he strengthens us that we're able to stand up under all the negative and the fear and the anxiety that tries to weigh us down. So there is power when we receive the, the Holy Spirit. Um. I'd probably like to bring it to a close there because there's so much that I'd, I'd like to tell you. But of all the things, I want you to remember this. Um, Simon Peter, when the Lord was there with him in the boat, when uh, the Lord said, put out your net for a big catch because they hadn't caught anything, nothing was happening in his life. You know, sometimes we're like that. We work all night. We work through the dark times. We work, walk, work through the hard times. And nothing seems to be happening. And then Jesus turns up and he says, do this. And he said to Peter, put your net out. And Peter said, I've done all that I could before, mate. You know, I've, I'm a tradie. I've done all this. I'm not an idiot, you know. Who's ever prayed like that to God? And he, I have. He comes back and goes, yes, you are. Anyway, God, I've done all the things I can do. And then God tells me to do something. And I go, God, I've done that before. I just don't want to do it again. And he says... Do it again. And so Peter threw the net out on the other side of the boat and he caught such a big catch that he, they couldn't contain it. Peter had a revelation of Jesus and he said, um, you know, God, you are the Son of God. And later on when Jesus was saying, who do people say I am? Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he said, well, do you want to leave me, Peter? And he says, no, God. Where will we go? To where shall we go? Prayer is that open door to God. So it's not like, where will we go? I know where I'm going. I'm going straight to the presence of God. I'm going, I'm going to talk to Dad about this. Lord, Heavenly Father, God, 
and we can open up and talk to him about anything, anything in our life. Whatever, when we're happy, when we're sad, when we're broken, when we're in need, we go to him. I'll finish with this verse, Psalm 46 verse 1. It's not on the slide, but remember it. Psalm 46 verse 1 says, God is our refuge, our place of safety, a place of shelter that we can run, and our strength. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. That's prayer. Okay, that's our relationship with God. I'd just like to challenge you now, and maybe if you need prayer, I'd love to pray with you.